So if you do, would not like a beautiful face on the screen, go ahead and turn your camera off, but we do love to see you. Um, so thank you again for joining us this evening. Um, let's start out with some polls to see who is in the room tonight. Um, Mark could not be here with us. So this is my first go with the polls. So let's see how I do. Um, here we go. Age at diagnosis. Please. Thank you so much. Y'all are doing great here. And I'll give you another second. Okay, we will end the poll. Share the results. And here we are. 50 to 59 years at age of diagnosis for 39% of us. Uh, 60 to 69, 26%, 40 to 49, 20%, and 30 to 39 for 4%. We must be missing our younger friends tonight because I know there's a bunch of you out there. Okay, next up. Let me go back here. Okay, um, length of diagnosis. How about that? Let's see. No, that did not work. Okay, never mind. Length of diagnosis. We're not doing that. <laughs> How about type of treatment? Here you go. What medication are you currently taking? Okay, another second. Here we go. Share results. So 60% of you are on electinib, 23% lorlatinib. I fall into this 10% of brigatinib users and 4% chemotherapy. And I'm sure there's also even some more little mix in there. Okay. Let's see. And progression. Let's check that out. If you progressed, what area was the progression? Okay, everybody in. Nice, let's see. Okay, share results. Oh, hopefully I got everybody there. 24% of people progressed to the brain. Um, let's see. And then it was a tie here, three-way tie for lymph nodes, lung and bone, 13% for each of those. And then the primary tumor for 7%. Okay. Thank you all for participating. Mark and I love these polls too, um, for all of us to kind of see, um, what is happening with our ALK family, um, and who is in the audience. It's also great, um, for our presenter, Dr. Patel, and um, for Jeff Sturm to see. Okay, so um, tonight we all, you know, just ask the question, where did you progress? And we all uh, are always thinking, what's our game plan when we do progress? We're laying in there every three months. Um, Want to know that we have plan A, B, and C. Well, here tonight, you will learn about another um, avenue, another um resource and some information to put in your pocket. So we are so grateful to have Dr. Patel here with us tonight. Here is a little background on him. Tejas Patel is a thoracic oncologist with an interest in identifying novel biomarkers in thoracic malignancies and in the development of targeted therapies for lung cancer. He received his undergraduate degree at the University of Pennsylvania. That's where I go. Followed by medical school at the University of Southern California. He did his internship, residency, and hematology oncology fellowship at the University of Colorado. His clinical research inter interests include molecular diagnostics in lung cancer, managing acquired resistance to research interests away, to targeted therapies such as ALK, EGFR, and ROS1 and developing rational combinations of therapies based on evolutionary and molecular biology. He's received multiple grants and awards, including the IASLC, um, John Fisher Legacy Young Investigator Award, that was in 2019, 
and the Hamaui Foundation Longevity Clinical Research Award in 2021, the Cancer League of Colorado Research Award in 2022, and the Gilead Research Scholars Award in 2023. He's also interested in novel clinical trials, trials that address unmet needs among our patients with lung cancer, and has written several investigators and investigator initiated trials. He's a member of both SWOG Lung Steering Committee and the National Comprehensive Cancer Network for Thoracic Malignancies. Dr. Patel believes that there is no one-size-fits-all approach in medicine, especially with cancer therapy. And also, I would like to add that he is a classical pianist. I tried to get him to do a little performance for us tonight, but I sprung that on him last minute. He did, though, promise to come back once he is prepared um, to do that for us. So we do have that to look forward to. Um, and you can see uh, that he uh, is definitely a dedicated clinician and researcher. And we are all so grateful for that. As we know, more research, more life. So thank you, Dr. Patil, for joining us. We are so grateful. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, and kind words, and it's a pleasure to be a part of the ALK community and really to um, participate in this way. I think it's wonderful that so many people are choosing to spend their Saturday evening uh, in this session. So I thank you all for joining. Uh, Dr. Patil, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how you got into the cancer research world and what, what perhaps motivated you. Yeah, it was an interesting journey. Um, I So I think I started, interest, I had an interest in cancer during my first year in medical school. I did a summer internship at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, really looking at pediatric oncology. And I was working very closely with a neurosurgeon there, looking at some really rare brain tumors. And um, so it was, you know, I just did some basic clinical research and that, was an area of interest that I um, kind of cultivated and grew throughout my medical school training. And then when I went to residency, I remember um, I have an oncology elective as my very first, um, one of my very first blocks in, in internship. And I remember at that time doing an elective with uh, none other than uh, Ross Kamich uh, at the time, who uh, I, at, at intern year, I started doing work with him and was very closely um, involved with a lot of the research that he did. Him and Bob Doble. Bob Doble is no longer at the University of Colorado. He sort of moved on to uh, start a pharmaceutical company of his own, but both of them were really pivotal mentors of mine. And so I was involved with them from internship, from residency, and then they were critical mentors of mine during fellowship as well. And so I trained um, under them for probably eight years, I think, at this point, if you collectively add up all of the time, seven years. Um, and as a faculty member, I think just one of the things I remember seeing in their clinic was just, you know, when I started as an intern in 2013, one of the things that I remembered was thinking that lung cancer is a really bad diagnosis and chemotherapy really doesn't do much of anything. And that was more or less true back in 2013. Uh, but one of the things I was exposed to in some of those early clinics was really seeing patients, actually the very first patient I ever saw with, with Ross Kamich had ALK positive non-small cell lung cancer. And so uh, that has always been a, a memory of mine is just, wow, we can actually not give brutal chemotherapy to patients and give a drug called crizotinib, which was you know, very quaint back in the day, but that was the drug that we were looking at. Actually, we had electinib as a phase one study uh, back then. And so we did have some patients who were progressing on crizotinib go on to that. Um, so that's what got me into lung cancer and specifically into precision oncology. And, and I've just sort of thought of it as one of the most interesting areas of research. So there's so much, um, there's so many advances in therapies in lung cancer specifically. And um, one of the things I've been really happy to be involved with is also just seeing and getting to know the patient advocate community. Really, there's been just a remarkable um, resource for patients to know what they're up against. So it's been really great. So the, the University of Colorado uh, I guess it's called the Lung Cancer Research Initiative is what you are part of, 
Could you right. tell us more about the scope of that and what other projects you can you can share with us that are ongoing there? Yeah, so we're I'm part of what's called the Thoracic Oncology Research Initiative, or TORI for short, which is at the University of Colorado. And really, this is a large scale initiative where we're trying to um, study lung cancer in multiple different areas. So we have a a researcher named Jamie Stutz, for example, who's very, very interested in getting lung cancer screening um, up underway and really thinking about how to implement it on a, on a almost on a statewide level, but what are the behavioral strategies we need to do so that patients who are at high risk for lung cancer actually get lung cancer screening. We have patients um, or, and research, or sorry, we have um, provi uh, providers and uh, basic science researchers who are really interested in early nodules. So when we get very early lung cancer detected, are there ways we can use immunotherapy in a very creative way for those patients who don't quite meet a diagnostic criteria of having cancer? So there are terms like squamous um, dysplasia or carcinoma in situ. Can we use immunotherapy for those patients? So that's an active area of research in one uh, of our groups. And then when it comes to my area of focus, I'm, I'm very interested in looking at precision oncology. We have a very well-established cancer cell line program. These are patient-derived cancer cell lines, meaning we obtained a biopsy from a patient, grew them out in a Petri dish, and we have um, annotated the clinical outcomes of that patient really well. Um, but more importantly for the patient, we actually can learn very unique things in this meth through this method that we can't just learn through traditional genomic testing. And in, uh, as you'll see in my talk, there, there is an example of one case where we did learn something very instructive and it actually did change the patient's outcome and eventual treatment course. So, so that's the area that I'm most interested in. And another area that I'm starting to get more research funding for and, and really hope to expand is this idea of cancer persistence. So most of my talk will be on resistance, meaning what happens when your ALK targeted therapy stops working? What do you do next? But the principle I'm trying to investigate is a little bit upstream of that. And that's really looking at if you have um, an ALK inhibitor like olectinib, pergotinib, or lorlatinib, and you start treatment, almost everyone in this room's first scan probably showed a, dr a dramatic reduction in the, in the tumor, but it is pretty rare to get a complete response. So most people did not get a complete response. I would argue, I would be willing to bet most people in this, in this audience here have what we call a partial response. So probably 60 to 70% of the tumor shrank. And my question is what is going on in that 30 to 40% that's left behind? How is that cancer cells adapting to electinib and brigatinib. One of the really fascinating things about that persister cell population is that if you biopsy them, they don't actually look genomically different from the, the diagnostic tumor, meaning there are no new genetic alterations. It's not quite resistant yet, but something is going on in those cells that's allowing it to survive. And I think trying to understand that at a mechanistic level is really important because I think that's where the new innovation, in my opinion, is going to, is, uh, going to help the patients with ALK positive and non muscle lung cancer. Well, thank you for sharing all of that. We really appreciate it. Uh, if you want to proceed with your presentation, do you have some slides to share with sure. us? Sure. Um, I'm very excited to share this. This was a talk I gave at the Dava Oncology Summit. This was in Kona uh, earlier this year. And so um, this is a, uh, let me just share my screen here real quickly. Never ceases to amaze me how many great places the, me the medical community gets to visit in the course of a year. <laughs> yeah, Kona was nice. I, I'm not going to lie. Um, okay, so this, can everyone see my slides? Yes. So this is an investigator initiated trial that I wrote uh, in conjunction with support from Janssen, which is looking at using amivantamab as an add-on therapy after progression on ROS1, ALK, and RET inhibitors. Um, and so these are my disclosures. So this is a slide that many in this audience would be familiar with, but just to recap, there are many different types of biological resistance. And when we think about resistance, I conceptually think of three categories of which two are shown here. There's a third one, which I'll kind of briefly mention, but not spend more time on for this talk. 
one type of resistance is called an on-target resistance. So if you look at this diagram here on the left, and you look at the furthest left side uh, receptor tyrosine kinase, what you see here is, and this is an example using EGFR, but in, this actually applies for ALK, this applies for ROS1, and this applies for RET fusion, uh, non-muscle lung cancer, is we start to see mutations that occur at the tyrosine kinase domain. And so this is where the drug is actually going and doing its work. And what you start to see are these little tiny mutations that prevent the um, uh, prevent the um, drug from binding effectively. And so this is an EGFR as an example, but for ALK, the most common one is G12O2R. Um, and there are many others that um, we all have heard about in this um, community. The other one that's really emerging as a major problem and what will be the focus of this study is what I call, the, the term here is oncogene kinase switch, but I prefer the term bypass signaling, and, and of which we've learned a lot about MET amplification. That is a major actor in uh, alpha positive mouth muscle lung cancer among patients who are being treated with electinib, brigatinib, or lorlatinib. Um, interestingly, you don't see this in patients who are being treated with crizotinib, and the main reason is that crizotinib is actually a dual ALK and MET inhibitor. And so in the era when we were using crizotinib more often, this actually never was a problem. This only became a problem once we started switching to lectinib, brigatinib, and lorlatinib, mostly because those drugs penetrate the brain better. But as a trade-off, we start to see this. And I'll have a separate slide that shows some more data on that. Um, actually, this is the slide. So this is a, a paper that came out of uh, the Mass General Group. Uh, Dagogo Jack was the lead author on this one. It's a very nice series looking at the incidence of MET resistance in ALK positive non-small cell lung cancer. And if you take all of these uh, cell lines that were generated at Mass General, um, you see that in about 15% of their cases, they would they had seen evidence of MET, uh, in this case, MET amplification, but they did also find some new interesting um, resistance mechanisms like MET fusions. And we have a paper upcoming that will look at this as well. On the right-hand side is a, um, a, a gene fusion that's very similar to ALK, but is obviously different in that these are RET fusions. And this is an example of a patient who was on a targeted therapy for RET called prosetinib, and then progressed. And when they did a lymph node biopsy, they actually showed that there was MET amplification. And this patient actually got a MET, um, a RET drug, prosetinib, plus a MET TKI or a MET tyrosine kinase inhibitor and had a response. So that's um, pretty exciting. This is a paper that we have submitted, it hopefully will be published in the next month or two. Uh, I'm still waiting for some editorial feedback, but this was submitted to JTO. And this is really a figure in one of the patients of mine that I treated with EGFR mutant lung cancer. And what I like about this is you can dynamically see what we did over time. So this was on the left-hand side, this was a patient before they started anything, there was no MET, um, and we did both paired blood and tissue biopsies in this patient, and you can see there was uh, no evidence of MET amplification. And then when they progressed on OC Mertinib here in the middle, this is an EGFR targeted therapy, you can see that they had both MET detected in the blood and also in tissue. We started this patient on OC Mertinib and Capmatinib. Capmatinib is a MET tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It's a pill that you can take twice a day. And in fact, what happened at three months after this was both the patient had a radiographic response, but they also had no detectable MET levels. And then when they, what's really interesting is when they progressed on the combination of OC Mertinib and Capmatinib, you start to see really uh, unusual things. So this patient had a MET D1228N mutation and an EGFR C797S. So these are both on target resistance mutations to EGFR and MET at the same time. And interestingly, MET amplification was gone. So what this is telling us is that this patient had actually now evolved two resistance mutations that blocked both EGFR and MET. This was actually a really sticky situation. And we wound up uh, treating this patient with chemotherapy. So um, I'll kind of be brief on this, but just to say I'm very uh, particular with the term I'm using, which is MET alterations and not MET amplification. And that's because MET alterations are, uh, are very heterogeneous. They're, they're, you can see MET exon 14 skip mutations. You can see MET gene amplifications. You can see MET fusions. And all of these can occur as resistance mechanisms. And so I think the more appropriate and broad term is MET alterations. Um, this is data that we submitted to JTO that is um, forthcoming, but really what you're seeing here is what's called a waterfall plot. And so 
Um, I know many of us in this room look at clinical trial data, but just to orient everyone. So if you look at the left-hand side, this is on the y-axis percentage change in the tumor size from baseline. And um, these are color coded to uh, mark various responses. So a complete response means 100%, meaning that the tumor was completely gone on the first scan. And then anything in blue is a partial response. And then anything less than 30% um, is considered stable disease. And so on the left-hand side is a diagram that shows each bar represents an individual patient. And this represents their treatment response graphed in this way. And what you ideally want to see in a very good waterfall plot is what you see here on the left-hand side, which is when you find a met alteration in a patient, and this includes patients who had mostly EGFR, but there's a lot of ALK positive patients in this group as well. And you treat them with a met targeted therapy, they actually do respond to that combination. And that's what this diagram is showing here on the left. So you want to see a lot of lines on the right, bottom right quadrant, like you do see here. And we see about 13% um, of these patients had complete responses. Um, and the objective response rate, which is really the most important measure when you look at trials, was 68%. So knowing you have a met alteration and then treating that met alteration irrespective of the underlying driver mutation. So it doesn't matter if you have EGFR, it doesn't matter if you have ALK, it doesn't matter if you have ROS1 or RET, you'll still get responses. What you're seeing here on the right-hand side is what happens if you give chemotherapy and you continue the targeted therapy. And you can see the response rates are nowhere near as good. So that's kind of an interesting observation suggesting that if you do have a MET alteration, you really should go on a MET targeted therapy. I think many of us do this and many academic oncologists will do this off label, but I think this is compelling data to show that this is actually an actionable alter, uh, alteration that we can target irrespective of the underlying driver. Um, I'm going to skip this slide because this is a, but this is looking at correlating um, progression free survival with um, response rate. So I think for the interest of time, I want to focus on this one, which is really showing that MET signaling can be actionable. So this is translational research from our group. Um, this was on lay who presented this in the 2019 um, ISLAC World uh, Lung Meeting. And what I want to first focus on is the um, figure on the left, and then we'll look at the CT scan on the right. So if you look on the figure on the left, what you see here are five cancer cell lines that are all ALK cancer cell lines. These are all patients who had ALK positive non-muscle lung cancer, progressed on electinib. We biopsied their tissue at progression. And what you can see here is that none of these patients had MET amplification as defined by FISH. So if you look at the top row um, and you look at their MET-FISH ratio, you don't see amplification. But when you look at a different assay, and this is called GRAB2, and this is a very unique type of assay that's trying to look at not um, to look at what's called phosphorylation. And so basically, if the MET pathway gets activated, the most downstream element is going to be this MET GRAB2 complex. And you can see that this is through the roof for most of these patients. And in fact, in CUDO41, which is this diagram here, this patient is shown here on the right. So this was this patient progressing on electinib. Actually, you know, I stand corrected. This patient was progressing on brigatinib. And you see this top CT scan with this big bulky lymph node here. This was biopsy. This was shown to have a very high MET-GRAB2 PLA. And even though this patient had no identifiable mechanism of resistance on NGS testing, we, based on this cell line data, we made a decision to treat this patient with brigatinib and crizotinib. This patient is still on brigatinib and crizotinib four and a half years later. And so this is an example of taking translational research that we do at the lab and really thinking about how to apply it to patients. Um, we talked about MET. What about EGFR signaling? Less is known about this, but it is a known mechanism of resistance to ROS1 and to RET non-muscle lung cancer. And so these are two separate um, research projects that were done at University of Colorado. This one was done, the one in the left was done in 2017. And it's the same kind of idea looking at EGFR GRAD2. These are downstream complexes. And what you can really see here is that when you do pre-post analyses, you can see that in the post analyses, you see a high increase of EGFR GRAB2, suggesting that this might be a mechanism of resistance in this ROS1 uh, non-muscle lung cancer line. Um, on, the, on the right here, you see a variety of different assays. So LOXO is a RET inhibitor. And what you really want to focus on is the red line. So if you look at the red line, what 
you see here is when you combine the RET inhibitor with an EGFR inhibitor called a FATNIB, you see a very nice decrease in these lines suggesting a response, suggesting that EGFR signaling was what was causing resistance all along. So on the basis of some of these translational uh, data, we, I'm going to skip this for a second. We decided to um, look at a drug called amivantamab. And so amivantamab is an interesting molecule. It is targeting both EGFR and MET. And based on our translational research, we hypothesized that many patients progressing on targeted therapies, and this includes our ALK positive patients, will progress through either an EGFR or MET pathway. And what's interesting is that it doesn't seem to really matter whether you have um, amplification. So MET amplification is what is most commonly talked about when we look at um, NGS reports. Uh, and I see a lot of patients asking, well, should we be concerned or worried about MET amplification? And the, my answer is yes. If you see it, that's obviously something we can treat. But I suspect a lot of patients are progressing on their ALK inhibitors are probably progressing through mechanisms involving EGFR and MET. And so this is a good example of durable responses seen in a MET IHC positive group. This is a type of test that we don't commonly do in ALK positive non-small cell lung cancer, but may have a may be relevant for us. And so this is a investigator initiated trial that we have uh, launched at the University of Colorado looking at patients using amivantamab in combination with ALK, ROS, and RET gene fusions. And so the idea here is um, you're on your TKI, and let's just focus on the ALK group. You're on either electinib, brigatinib, or lorlatinib. It doesn't matter which one, but you have to be on this TKI for three months. And then if there's progression, of identif at least three months, three months or more. And if there's progression identified, then you get... Um, you, you continue on the TKI and you continue on the same dose that you were on. And then we add an amivantamab based on weight. So if you're less than 80 kilograms, we do the 1050. If you're greater than 80 kilograms, it's 1400 milligrams. And then we have separating, we'll separate them out into an ALK cohort, a REC cohort, and a ROS1 cohort. Um, the key catch here is no chemotherapy immediately prior to trial entry. So prior chemotherapy is allowed. You just can't have been on chemotherapy three months before starting this, this study. So that, that's a major uh, stipulation. And we've already enrolled two patients. The first patient was a RET positive patient, and the second patient actually has ALK positive non-small cell cancer. I actually see her this week, so I'm be interested to see what those scans show. Uh, but clinically improving after this combination. And so we're really excited to launch this. We're partnering with the University of Michigan and the Mass General Group to run this um, investigative initiated trial. And we were very selective in picking those centers just because they have a lot of experience with out positive non-small cell lung cancer as well. And so we hope to accrue, there's 35 patients that we plan to enroll over the next three years. And um, so this is a, a study that I think may be of benefit for patients in this community. Uh, it's one that I would ask to consider. And so this is my information and, and my Twitter handle, um, and I will certainly take questions at this time. So if I may uh, dig in on the, on the questions that I came up with, I've studied the um, trial description in clinicaltrials.gov to some extent, and it needs some updating. It's great to hear that uh, the trial will also be open at University of Michigan and Mass General. Um, who are the investigators there? Angel Quinn is at University of Michigan and Jessica Lynn is at Mass General. And both great friends of ours, as, as are you. So I appreciate that. So one of the things that I'm a little confused about is some of the language with MET. Um, mm. You know, you use the term MET alteration, you use the term MET amplification, and you use the term MET signaling. Mm -hmm. So if I go and, and get tested for MET upon ALK progression, they usually test for MET alteration. Mm -hmm. But we're, what we're actually treating is the lack of a MET alteration here. Can you sort that out for me? Yeah, yeah. No, this is a very, uh, it's very kind of... Um, there's a lot of diagnostic questions that remain unanswered with MET. And my general theory here, and again, it is a theory and I could be wrong, but my general theory here is that 
when cancer cells adapt or evolve resistance to a targeted therapy like electinib, and let's say they're using it through the MET pathway, it doesn't have to be a MET mutation that we can detect on a um, on an NGS, next generation sequencing panel. In fact, it might likely not be. It'll probably be more likely to be some kind of activated signaling. And we don't have a good way to capture signaling. Gra the GRAB2 PLA is one that we've been looking at. There are issues with it. So I didn't cover that in this slide, but in grants when we've been proposing this, this is, you know, it's not a, it's not a uh, yet um, CLIA certified, meaning ready for commercial prime time assay. It's still a very much a research experimental assay. And we're collaborating with a group in Moffitt that has really refined this uh, procedure really well. So, so, but the, the, the larger point is when you look at the amivantamab data, one of the things that was so surprising about it was that when they first looked at this drug, they looked at patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer on OC Mertinib. And many of those patients had no mechanism of resistance, yet when they combined, um, when they added in amivantamab, they actually responded. And so that tells you that there must have been some kind of EGFR met resistance pathway that was not detected on genetic standard genomic testing mm -hmm. that was probably driving resistance. And so I think we just have bad ways of capturing um, EGFR and MET signaling in a resistance setting. And that's where I think this trial might play a role. So the theory, the primary theory for which you have significant evidence through the GRAB testing, whatever you called, um, is that there's MET and or EGFR signaling going on upon progression without an identifiable MET alteration or amplification yeah. or EGFR MET. Amplification. Yeah, and that so, was most. I can in in the slides here, if I if I may. Yeah, uh, sure. That was most well shown here. Um, let me just pull up this slide. So this was the slide that I think really reinforced this for me. So these were five separate patients that had all progressed on electinib, and if you look at their met fish, which is typically how we think about met resistance, we think of it as gene amplification. Well, these were all normal. But when you look at the, the PLA assay here below, they're all abnormal. So they, these are these these all of these cell lines, in my opinion, are deriving resistance through MET, but this is not a mechanism that you can routinely test. This is very much an experimental assay. And then as proof of principle, we used one of these cell lines, this one here, the one in the far left. That's this patient over here that didn't have a mechanism of resistance, but was on further probing really was actually being driven by MET as a resistance mechanism. And this is an example of a patient who responded to brigatinib and crizotinib. So there's your evidence and therefore your theory. Yeah. Um, so uh, typically you, you folks at University of Colorado, the sponsors of this trial and and Jansen is a collaborator. Usually it's the other way around. Um, how did that come about? <laughs> we made some dis uh, strategic decisions with this study. One of the major decisions was there are major advantages through running it as an IIT through the University of Colorado system because there's a lot of support that we get from the Institution for Investigator Initiated Trials. And I have to say that the project team that I'm working with is just absolutely phenomenal and really has made this one of the most smooth processes I could ask for. The main downside with doing it through the University of Colorado is that we can only run it at three sites, University of Colorado, and then we have to be very selective about which two other sites we would wanna pick. And part of the reason I um, reached out to Angel Quinn and Jessica Lynn at, at University of Michigan and Mass General is one, they have a lot of experience in the ALK positive community and see a lot of ALK positive patients. And if this is gonna be a study that benefits, um, I mean, ALK, ROS1 and RET, and these are all institutions that have familiarity with these uh, rare oncogenes. I, I wanted a trial that could enroll quickly and, and that, would put, that was gonna help patients we would know quickly as well. And so I didn't wanna have a study that was opening up and running for six years and we were just struggling to accrue because we weren't seeing the patient. So part of the trial design was actually figuring out where the patients are or where they go to for their 
um, uh, second opinions or any kind of research and then and then reaching out to those investigators. So this trial is for a very specific subset of ALK progressors. Can you it, clarify yes, that? Yes. And and when you know there are there are other trials out there too, you know, so for example, Nuvalent has a um a, a new agent NVL655, which is a very exciting compound. It gets to the initial um distinction I drew between what I call off-target and on-target resistance. I think the Nuvalent drug will be most effective for patients in the ALK community that have like a G12O2R mutation and maybe a, another compound mutation. So two compound mutations on target might do really well on the Nuvalent study. If, however, you're progressing on lorlatinib and there's no identifiable mechanism of resistance, I'm not sure going on a fourth generation ALK inhibitor is going to change that direction. I think there's a, some kind of undiagnosed bypass signal that is happening that is causing cancer to progress. And I'm not saying that MET is the only pathway. We, we clearly know there's other um, signaling pathways involved. We know the RAS, RAF, MAP kinase pathway is involved. We know that um, uh, we see a lot of patients now with uh, AXL signaling, and that's a, that's a difficult one because there's not a great target for that. So, so there's very different kinds of pathways, but if there is a possibility of MET being involved, we, we have really good data now to show that MET inhibitors do actually result in actionable responses. The theory here and what this trial is doing that's different than other studies is we're taking it a step further and we're saying, I, we're willing to bet that probably more people have MET as a mechanism of resistance than we're picking up on standard genomic testing. That's the bet. And we could be wrong. And I should mention our trial is designed in a way where we have an interim futility analysis. So after 16 patients are enrolled and we're not seeing a signal, we're not going to keep this trial opening. If it's not going to help patients, we want to know quickly and then move on to the next thing that might help patients. Okay. So if I'm on Lorlotinib and I have, I have the unfortunate reality at the moment of a tumor that has a double mutation. And I work with Ross Kamich as my second opinion doctor. And he immediately asked Nuvalent if uh, NVL655 would cover those two mutations. They said, well, we don't know. We're not sure. We haven't seen that one. Mm -hmm. um, and then I asked him if amivantamab would be a good one for me. And he said, no, probably not, um, because we know it's an on-target mutation and not a mystery mutation, which is really what your treatment and, and empty amivantamab for ALK patients is, is about. So what percentage, I know I've seen pie charts and I've seen all kinds of different pie charts that show the number of patients that get ALK mutations that are on target mutations, the number of patients that get met um, alteration, diagnosable met alteration and diagnosable EGFR alterations. Um, and then there's that whole slice of the pie that has no alterations at all that are mm -hmm. identifiable, which is really what amivantamab is targeted for. Is that yeah. correct? Um, yes, um, with the with the small caveat that um, amivantamab, if you do have, for example, med amplification, we, this drug will will work on that patient population, just given what we know. It's but the unknown is whether it'll work in that pie where we did, quote no identifiable mechanism. Um, we suspect that there's probably a significant chunk of those that might have met or EGFR signaling as a resistance. And in in University of Colorado's world, what percentage of patients fit into that unidentifiable pie? It's more than I would like. It's probably close to 50%. Um, and so when, every time we see these pie charts, uh, my eye always goes to that gray side of the chart, which is 50%. We don't know. And I'm like, well, that's that's an unmet need then. We, th there's a huge unmet need there. If right. half the people, we don't know what's going on. So Yeah, the uh, out positive medical committees have seen... Uh, that gray part of the pie chart range from 30% to 65% mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think I think forty five to fifty percent sounds about right. I think now that we're starting to recognize more about MedAmp, and and I think we're starting to dissect some of these off target signaling, that might get smaller, but it's still it's still way higher than I would like it to be. I mean, it really should be in the five percent range, um, and it's not. So, so, um, given all of that patient is in the gray part of the pie chart where there's no identifiable mutation on progression, the really the next step is chemotherapy. Correct? As of now, that's what we would generally recommend. I would say that there are that or a clinical trial that is well designed and well constructed. And what I mean by that is, yes, anyone can enroll in a clinical trial. There's many out there. Will they work for you? That's where I think you need your oncologist to be really straight and just say, because most of the trials that I'm seeing for ALK positive patients literally do require patients to stop their TKI and go on said experimental agent. And if that's the proposition, I would say, well, we know chemotherapy works. We, I mean, we have data on it. There's about a, um, you know, a 30% objective response rate, but the PFS, especially with the pemetrexid based chemotherapy regimen in out positive patients can be really good. I mean, I have patients who have been on 60 cycles of pemetrexid. It's can be kind of wild. So Which is how much time? Uh, six, do, I don't know, do the math. 60 times three weeks is 180 weeks. And then how many of those? I mean, that's a long three plus time years. to be on pemetrexid. Yeah. Um, it gets old, their creatinine, their kidney, kidneys don't love it. Um, but but that, that is a strategy that does work. And so I think the, the, the ask for clinical trials is really going to be to design studies that allow targeted therapies to stay and think about doing strategies that add in a, a treatment, such as a med inhibitor or um, you know, something of that nature. So amivantamab, made by Janssen Pharmaceuticals, is a bispecific EGFR monoclonal antibody. Mm -hmm. Do I have that right? Yes. But it also um, addresses the epithelial, epithelial to men, menisque, how do you say it, mesenchymal transition uh, reception, receptor. I, I, I butchered that. Can you say that right? Um, yeah, so there's kind of, you know, it's a really interesting drug because it, um, well, so it's it, it binds epidermal growth factor, which is EGFR, and then it binds mesen mesenchymal epithelial transition factor, but that's actually just short for saying MET, um, the MET cell surface receptor. Oh, okay, okay. But what's really crazy about this drug, and I've, I've been studying this molecule for a lot, trying to figure out how it works, and I, I think it, it works in kind of three ways. And I and it's hard to know which one is actually the center and dominant mechanism. So one is it literally just blocks EGFR and MET signaling. That's, that's the kind of mechanism I'm using when I'm talking about it in this trial. But it turns out there's actually two other ways it works that are kind of interesting. So one is it, it does have some immune cell directing activity through this process called trogocytosis. Now, I'm not sure I know trogocytosis any more than anyone else here. That's for my immunologist friend, Aaron Schenk at University of Colorado to nerd out about macrophages and all of that stuff. So that's not my hobby horse, but it is interesting to see that that, um, th that that might actually be playing a major role too, that there's also not just a EGFR met signaling blockade, but there's probably some kind of immune activation happening with that to that. It's a really interesting drug. So I, I looked at the trial for amivantamab for EGFR patients, EGFR exon 20 insertion uh, mutation. Um, and it's kind of mature. You know, we're two, three years down the road now. And um, objective response rate um, was 37% mm -hmm. at 23 months. And the overall survival was 23 months. Mm -hmm. progression free survival was six months 6.9 months um now those patients were post chemotherapy so presumably they were post egfr tkis yeah and were you know there was probably a pretty good percentage of pretty sick patients in that population 
Um, yeah, so the challenge with that study, if I if I think if we're talking about the same one, I think this is for EGFR exon 20 insertion patients. Um, one of the challenges with the EGFR exon 20 group is that their mutations are really challenging to target. And, and, and there's just sort of structural biochemical reasons why. It, it has nothing to do with um, the drug amivantamab. And in fact, when you look at another study of, of theirs, they've looked at this drug in combination with um, with uh, Ocimertinib, or sorry, with Lazertinib, which is the, basically their version of Ocimertinib, um, after, pro uh, after patients progress. So the idea was you progress on Ocimertinib, which is a first you know generation TKI. Then you then after progression, you switch to lazertinib. And remember, lazertinib is an EGFR TKI just like osimertinib. So it's a lateral switch there. And then you add in amivantamab. And that study actually had some pretty surprising results too. And, and really, the thing that I was most struck by, that was the chrysalis data. I'll see if I can show that, pull that up here. But the thing that was most surprising was you see very high response rates, almost 61% in the MET positive group. And here, MET positive is not gene amplification. What was interesting here was MET positive was defined as just having a high cell surface expression of MET. So again, it gets to this idea that how cancers evolve MET signaling may not be the way we traditionally capture it on a blood biopsy or a tissue biopsy. It might be some really small changes, but those changes could be actionable. And I think the chrysalis data really shows that. So if you do have met uh, IHC expression, those patients did really well. I mean, those are patients that are going on 14, 15 months on treatment, no, no progression. Um, and so those are the ones that I think um, benefited the most. And so we'll see how that goes with this one. So the, the treatment uh, for outpatients with amivantamab is intravenous? It is intravenous. And it's intravenous until we get to a situation where they are looking at a subcutaneous sub formulation right now. It is not yet available. Um, and certainly for this trial, it's not available. Um, but if there is proof of principle here, I would love to see a larger study using a subcutaneous monthly injection, uh, which I think is just much more patient friendly than IV infusions. So how many, uh, how often and how many times and for how long? Do patients have to come for this treatment? So the first month is a little bit busy because we do a split dose at the very beginning. So it's day one, day two. Um, so literally the first day, and then you have to come back the second day. Then day, then weekly for the first month. So day eight, day 15, day 22. Once you get past the first month, um, and, and the reason it's designed that way is to, uh, to really observe patients and minimize the risk of an infusion reaction, which can occur mostly within the first few doses. And that's why the first month is designed this way. When you get to the second month, it's bi-weekly. Um, again, not ideal because you're, again, you're looking at an IV treatment still, but um, I think first steps are really just to show proof of principle. And then I think from there on, if we can modify it to a longer formulation dosing or a subcutaneous formulation dosing, I think that would be ideal. Um, from my partner, Ray Hall, is asking if there's assistance to pay for hotels in Colorado. Yeah, and, and, can, people, and can can I can I do the trial in the wintertime so I can go skiing in between treatments? You, you can certainly do that, yes. Uh, we would encourage skiing. Um, no, I, yeah, the short answer is yes, but I, I don't want to answer that with a definitive yes, I'd have to see how we've structured this in, uh, with Janssen. Um, so far, the first few patients are Colorado local. And so I haven't had this conversation yet, but I'm imagining I will. Um, yeah, but all, for all question. practical purposes, they're gonna have to be local patients. Not necessarily, no, not necessarily. I, I, I've had patients, uh, I, had a, I had a consult from a patient from Utah who, who was interested in this study. So, you know, I think if the drug works and um, we can figure out something, I, we, we have had grants or something to help patients with, with defray the cost of transportation. Um, and um, some companies are more uh, willing to do this than others. I think it's very trial specific and I'll just have to ask Jansen what their policy is. But we had a NRG1 fusion study and we had a patient fly weekly for almost a year plus on this study. And the company paid for all of that. Not so. This guy became a Delta Pro 
number one member and got the craziest number of miles out of this trial. So, uh, Summer, you want to you want to take over for a bit and deal You're with the questions great, from? But, yeah, we can definitely pull some. There are some great questions um, in the chat. So let's check out um, some of these or Dr. Patel, if you even see them in here. Um, is the testing um, available outside of your research model? Yes, the MET and GRV2 or? The, the GRAB, yeah, MET, the GRAB2 PLA, no. Right now, uh, you're still working on trying to, there are kind of um, technical aspects of this assay that we're trying to validate before, uh, you know, so this is not yet commercial or prime time. Um, Wow. Okay. And it's funny because in our support group, it, when somebody's progressing and they can't figure out why, and then we all jump all over them, get a fish test, get a fish test. So yeah. um, at that point, also, we should say, reach out to Colorado or Michigan. Yeah. Or yeah. Yeah. And, I, and again, it, just because this is not a commercial test, so like even if patients are generous enough to donate their samples, again, it's just, we don't know just from this grab to PLA, whether this you know, we're still working out the kinks with this assay. So it's it's definitely not something I would say is fully yet for prime time, but it's what is the point of all of that was just to show how we're thinking about where MET plays a role here. Um, but I agree, yes, do NGS testing, please do a liquid biopsy, please do a tissue NGS, please do MET and HER2 fish if possible. Okay, and then somebody else had a great question in there. So Thank you for that um, rundown. Hold on, let's see about what if they couldn't get a biopsy? So they would do the blood. If they experience progression, a tissue sample is not available, nor an a blood, this like- uh, Yeah, so this is, this is um, yeah, so this is an interesting question. So um, that will be tricky because we do need a tissue biopsy. So that is one thing I, I want to put for us. This trial does require a tissue biopsy in part because so much of the trial is predicated on this assumption that it, we are thinking that there's EGFR and MET signaling that we're not capturing. So we need to be able to prove that. If we don't have tissue samples to prove that, then we don't, we're actually not uh, confirming our hypothesis. And then, you know, so, so, the, so tissue biopsies are required. But we don't necessarily need the biopsy to, to, to prove that you have an ALK fusion. Like if you were diagnosed with an ALK mutation or an ALK fusion back in 2019 and you still have that foundation report, that's all we need. We don't need to reconfirm that you have an ALK anything. Gotcha. Okay. So you can somebody can be a candidate if it's brain progression as long as they had the initial tissue sample or... If they have brain progression, they could still be a candidate. This would be a question that we'd want to have, you know, if I was to see this patient or, or, or Dr. Quinn or Dr. Lynn, I think we'd have a real conversation about, you know, is this the right move right okay. now or should we think about some other strategy to protect the brain? But you're, looking for, fresh, what's you're looking for fresh biopsy tissue. Yeah, for this study. And, and not archival tissue. Archival tissue will be um, requested, but it's not nest like, so the requirements are you have some kind of molecular test that says you have ALK, right? At the bare minimum, you need to know you have ALK. And then a biopsy is needed at time of progression. Mostly the real reason is to rule out small cell transformation. Really those patients should not be on the study. They should be uh, going to getting chemotherapy. And as of now, there's no blood biopsy that can rule that out. Um, and so that's one of the main reasons we want to get a biopsy, but also we'll need some of that tissue to do translational research. So you want to make sure you get fresh tissue within 24 hours or, or that the biopsy is done right there at university? Not, no, sorry, not hours. fresh tissue. Yeah, okay, I understand your question. We just need the slides. So as long as a tissue biopsy was done on progression and we have FFPE slides, um, that's fine. We don't need so part. So tissue. part of it could go for a patient's NGS testing, and yes. the other part could come to you. Correct. Correct. Yes. Thanks for clarifying. That's correct. Go for it, Summer. Great. And then what do we have? Um, the second person in the trial is now on electinib. Can you tell us? Did that person actually experience progression? And then. Um, so we can't disclose too much about patients on study. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to disclose that. They're still on trial, and I think for confidentiality reasons. Um, all I can say is that they're doing well on the trial. How is the toxicity? That's something we're starting to learn about. And, and you know, we put a lot of safeguards into this because one of the unknowns we're doing here is we're allowing patients to stay on their TKI 
and we're adding in a new drug, amivantamab. And while I don't have any reason to suspect that there's drug-drug interactions here, you know, this is a trial, we don't know that. And I don't wanna jump in thinking we do. So there's a lot of like weekly assessments. I would say the biggest uh, adverse events seem to be actually coming from infusion related reactions. So I think what we're learning from this, from the first two patients that we put on it is to start at half the rate with the first infusion and to really heavily premedicate them um, in terms of like giving them Benadryl, giving them uh, you know, all this stuff to prevent an infusion reaction. And by the time we get to dose number three, they're usually not having this problem. So the infusion related reaction was something we learned and it's all rate dependent. So one of the changes we're gonna request and when they open it up at Michigan and Mass General is to start at a half rate initially. That seems to have really done the trick for the second patient that went on the study. Great, thanks. That is fabulous. Um, let's see, here was someone that didn't qualify. They're enrolled in the ALK initiative at the University of Michigan. Um, yeah, I think collabor uh, I'm just reading this over. I don't know if you can see this, Dr. Patel. If they're wondering, like, is there a benefit to, um, uh, from the collaboration with Dr. Chen? I think we yes. all... Yes, um, is a short answer. Her and I collaborate. So um, yes, that I mean, and if not, if not even just this trial, just tissue. The, I know University of Michigan has a wonderful uh, translational initiative going through, um, and I think um, having centers of excellence like that will really be helpful to just understand what's going on at a at a basic science level. Yeah. Awesome. Um, is can I answer this? Is yes, please. Good or bad for prognosis? Um, I don't think, well, so we've studied med amplification in, so there was a lot of research in med amplification back in the 2013, 2014 era, and it was considered a bad prognostic factor, but that was in the chemotherapy era. I think in the, in the current era, I think of med amplification, not so much as a good or bad prognosis. I don't think we really know, but it, it's definitely a resistance mechanism that we can treat. And so is that good or bad? I think that depends on what your perspective is. To me, it's good in the sense that you can get a targeted therapy and combine it with another targeted therapy and go more time without chemotherapy. That's maybe good. But in terms of prognosis, I don't think we still know the answer to that. There, I know there are trials ongoing that are looking at this. Um, that is awesome. Let's see, considered cyber knife. Oh, that might. I think anybody else, any other questions that you would, this has been so helpful. Um, and Dr. Patel, we're so grateful for you giving up time tonight on your oh, Sunday you. night. <laughs> we are all eager to come and listen to you, but we really appreciate the time that you take away from your family and your work to be with us. So thank you all. It was a real pleasure. Yeah. And I'll say particularly from the ALK positive medical committees, thank you very much for all the work you're doing. And we certainly look forward to your progress in the future. Thank yes. you. Um, I am just going to give a quick rundown for our other um, talks, and then we will all um, thank you. But if you all um, would like to join us on Sunday, October 8th, we have our Get Ready for Lung Cancer Awareness Month, um, getting ready to spread the word. Anyone with lungs can get lung cancer, more research, more life. How do we raise those funds for research? And also we'll hear from ALK Positive Inc.'s um, Ken Culver, our Director of Research and Clinical Affairs. It was his one year anniversary with us recently and he's gonna give us an update about the exciting things um, happening with our medical committees. On October 29th, um, we have Dr. Yasser Elliman from MD Anderson coming on to talk about um, his Bright Start trial. What did it show? What is local consolidative therapy? They're big in bet to that in Colorado. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. Um, we're right. We're, we're big believers of that here too. You definitely do local ablative therapy if possible. And do you do it mostly with uh, targeted radiation? So my practice is maybe, uh, I, I know it's being studied in trials, but I'll tell you what I do. I, I see patients, I, I start them on an ALK TKI, usually within two to three weeks, I'll see them again, just to make sure there's no side effects because these drugs work so quickly that if we're gonna get into side effects, we're gonna know within the first two weeks of starting. That's kind of how it is. 
And then usually two months after I'll get a CT scan just to make sure we're making progress that we're not having surprises like an early progression event. Those are usually, those are thankfully rare, but when they happen, I get really concerned about what's happening next with the patient. And then sometime in the kind of four to four month range or so, I actually will get a repeat PET scan and look for what areas are still residual that have FDG avidity. And then that time I will sort of, you know, depending on what the scan shows and what's still residual or active, I might consider locally ablative radiotherapy. And in the right patient, and I've done this for one of my out positive patients, um, there was just a residual lung nodule, everything else had cleared up, their brain mats were smaller. Um, I actually sent that patient for a lobectomy and just removed it out and had a mediastinal nodal dissection. So in, in the right patient, surgery makes sense. Um, um, just as, as an aside to all of these talks, we've been um, connecting with the galvanized uh, company that mm -hmm. makes their uh, post-electric fields mm -hmm. uh, local ablative therapy that uh, we had a real good look at their um, immuno responses and abscopal effect data. And um, they seem really eager to give away one of their machines to one of the big uh, teaching organizations. And they particularly mentioned the University of Colorado. So it might be useful for us to make uh, an introduction there and sure. perhaps seek a I'm presentation always, I'm, from that. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm open to hearing good ideas. So definitely. And that will be an Alta coming to you all in the future because that sounds <laughs> exactly <laughs> as everyone's going. Wait, what is that? It's really great <laughs> and very exciting, cutting edge technology. Stay tuned. Uh, and, Sorry, uh, no, you're great. I just know everybody's like, what? And it is. It's so awesome and exciting. Um, okay, and then in November. Um, we're going to do our um, longitudinal study update now called the ALK Life Study. Colin Barton will come on and give us an update on that with Ken, how you all can um, play a role in what uh, your treatment is doing, what your diet, your history, how everything is um impacting your path does it make a difference does it not um and then also we will have an ask the expert with the key opinion leader so stay tuned be watching for the date for that it'll be on a sunday i'll talk also new valent will be back with an update once they um release their fourth quarter um information, then they will be hopping on over to Alk Talk to um, update us all. So that's super exciting. Um, and you can bring um, your questions. Um, and then also, of course, with the holidays approaching, mental health is always key, getting palliative care on your team. So um, we will also be having a palliative care mental health talk in December. So that is what is ahead for, uh, for us. So thank you all so much for joining us, Dr. Patel. Again, thank you so much for spending this time with us this evening. We will be having you on again. You better get those little fingers practicing. <laughs> and we all yeah. uh, would love to hear you play um, and are so grateful for all, all of your research. Jeff, thank you for moderating. Yes. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you all. This is a really wonderful opportunity. I always love doing these. So um, anytime. Well, we love to have you. Thank you. And all the work you're doing behind the scenes for us. So grateful. We, I agree. We need to shrink that 50%, right? Or at least find some answers. So um, thank you. If you all would like to unmute and say thank you. And thank have a you. Good thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you all. Thank you all. Have a great day. Yeah. We Bye. need to get in the marketplace. Yes. <laughs>